Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and we are at the intersection of sexuality and reality, where it meets at the streets of LGBTQ Avenue and LDS Street. It's podcast episodes just like this that help us to better understand the experiences of the LGBTQ community and also how we can all support and help those uh, community members. If you want to support the Latter Gay Stories podcast, there's a couple simple and easy ways of doing that. First, by making a financial donation. We're Venmo friendly at Latter Gay Stories. And if you want to make a monthly donation to the podcast, you can log on to our website at LatterGayStories.org and click on the Donate tab. Another free and easy way of helping the podcast survive is by sharing episodes just like this. If you are watching on the video or audio, uh, if you're watching on one of the video versions through YouTube or Facebook, we invite you to share uh, this episode and others. And if you're listening to us on the audio version, anywhere you catch your favorite podcasts, we invite you to subscribe to the channel. Again, it's podcast episodes like this to help, that help us to fulfill Elder Ballard's words of listening to and better understanding the experiences of the LGBTQ community. Because as he said in 2017, the Latter-day Saints aren't doing a good job at doing, uh, of listening. So um, I, I thank you for giving us an hour of your time to listen to this story. Today's podcast episode is unique. Uh, for many of you that know my personal story, it is about a mixed orientation marriage. Uh, my, my experience was that that began in a mixed orientation marriage, and that is the topic of today's episode. We're going to have a candid discussion about the intricacies, the um, sensitive nature of a mixed orientation marriage, especially at the intersection of Mormonism, and how mixed orientation marriages can work uh, under certain circumstances, and also the realities of mixed orientation marriages both from a straight and a non-straight spouse perspective. So without much more, I want to introduce and welcome to the podcast, Tate and Kara Avey. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Are you ready for this? <laughs> no answer? Ready as well. Ever. Okay, perfect. We're ready. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you for being open and candid about sharing your story. Um, candidly on my part, holding a holding space for a mixed orientation marriage discussion um, not only brings up my own history, uh, but for many listeners, they are going to be eager to doubt everything you say in your podcast. Mm -hmm. Right. Because, um, spoiler alert, here's a couple who is striving to make it work in a mixed orientation marriage when the statistics and studies uh, overwhelmingly show that mixed orientation marriages are tough. Um, they statistically don't last and um, it's sometimes often just billed as a waste of time. But I think in this episode it will be important for us to understand and navigate and, and just take a deeper look at your experience because there are a couple different things that have existed in, in your relationship that often don't exist in many other mixed orientation marriages and we'll talk about that. Um, the ability to work together, uh, disclosure, uh, um, lifting each other, understanding. I mean, even the fact that you're willing to be open and, and speak um, has something to do with the ability of making your relationship stronger. And so those are things we're going to discuss. Before we jump into that, um, let's let the audience get to know you a little better. Um, maybe we'll start with you, Kara. <laughs> okay, um, I'm Kara. I'm from Fountain Hills, Arizona which is like a suburb of Phoenix, Mesa area. Um, let's see. <laughs> I have been a mother since I was 19. Um, I was a single mom until I was 23 when Tate and I ended up getting married. And she's from another relationship, but um, I've been the sole parent. So that was definitely a uh, fast forward into growing up so I didn't get too much of my single adult hood that a lot of people get or their college life that a lot of people get so um, so that's been most of my adult life is being a mother um, and so a lot of decisions I've made in life have had to do with how they're gonna affect my daughter um, and so right now we moved up to Cedar City when Tate and I got married and I'm a stay-at-home mom, and now we have a son together, too, and 
a little girl on the way in August. So, yeah. <laughs> Date. Um, yeah, so as she said, we knew each other in Arizona. Um, I was I moved around a little bit growing up, but um, mainly grew up in Phoenix, Arizona. And um, the caboose child, there's uh, 14 years between me and my next oldest sibling. Uh, so I've gotten spoiled my whole life. And we, uh, I believe she mentioned we, we dated in high school for a little bit and went our separate ways um, and then dated again after my mission um, and got married. I got my bachelor's in psychology um, and about to start my master's in social work up in Oregon. Great. I think we should start this um, episode with understanding um, or beginning at the point where Tate, you felt different, <laughs> where you recognize that I may not be exactly like um, my friends, um, or even as you're raised in the church, the roles that are traditionally created for mm -hmm. little 12 year old kid growing up in Mormonism. Mm -hmm. At what point did you realize I'm different? Man, <laughs> really, really young. Um, I, I, I think that I fit the kind of stereotypical um, queer um, LDS man. <laughs> growing up, I loved playing with Barbies, loved dressing up. Um, loved traditionally feminine things. Um, and so very young, I was told that that was not appropriate, um, that that was bad, that um, I, uh, I would hide my dolls. I would hide those parts of me um, in order to not be made fun of or, or bullied uh, growing up by, by family and friends. And, and I think that ultimately looking back, I think it was um, in, in other people's minds, lighthearted teasing but it was such a soft spot for me because that's really what I believed. I really believed that fundamentally I was, um, I, I thought that God had messed up, that, um, that somehow I, I had been a mistake and some, I constantly trying to figure out how do I become like everyone else? Everyone else seems to, to get it so naturally sports, cars, uh, women, <laughs> uh, and, and, and so it was constantly trying to figure out, okay, how do I become like everyone else? Because I am not what I'm supposed to be. Um, and so as I grew up, I just learned to hide that better. And I think, as you mentioned, unfortunately, there wasn't any messages for people like me as a kid. I remember really young um, in, in primary talking about, uh, as boys, we were talked to about um, making sure that we treated girls with respect and that we didn't look at girls um, inappropriately. Um, and so I remember kind of lying to myself. I think deep down I, I saw the hypocrisy, but uh, I remember thinking, you're having these thoughts about other boys, but like they didn't talk about that. So like, that's not the problem. You just need to not look at girls that way. And so I kind of found this loophole of like not talking about it because I knew that that was bad in a society realm, but then also kind of like trying to convince myself that I was in the clear because I wasn't um, following this mold of what I shouldn't be doing in a, in a religious realm, if that makes any sense. Sure, you weren't lusting after women, therefore you had your celestial golden ticket. Right, <laughs> right, totally. But yet, guys were a completely different story. Yeah, yeah, and, and convincing myself that there was nothing wrong with that, but also it was, it was interesting because like convincing myself that therefore there's nothing wrong with that, but also having this deep hatred for that part of myself and, and feeling that everything was wrong with that. And that was more despicable and more grotesque than the straight man's lust. Yeah, you, you talk about how hard it was to kind of navigate that experience based on 
no resources or few resources. Um, where could your family life or church life have, what could they have done to make that a little easier for you? That's something that I, I speak out a lot um, about a lot. I'm sure the people who are close to me are, are tired of hearing it, but, but it needs to change. You know, we need to have a script for, for children in primary to be able to understand themselves. Um, and so instead of just saying, um, don't look at girls in scantily clothed, like just be respectful of human beings and, and respect people's bodies and respect people's privacy and consent and all of those things. Like, let's have more of a, just across the board conversation instead of assuming people's experiences and, um, and then also assuming that people who are LGBTQ aren't in the circle, right? So many painful experiences of conversations at church and, and otherwise of people saying, you know, well, talking about the, the LGBTQ community as negative and as destroying the, the family proclamation and... I'm sitting there and, and hearing these things and it just confirms this, yeah, you are of the devil. You are bad. You are so deranged and so broken that there really isn't a space for you here and you need to, you need to hide that part of yourself or, or people will not accept you. Um, and so I, I tell people all the time, like, Assume that someone in your um, young men's group, young women's group, um, sacrament meeting, like wherever you're speaking at, at home, in, at family reunions, like assume that someone is not straight because if you have a big enough group, someone isn't. As statistically, right. it, do, it doesn't matter 10% conservatively will mm -hmm. identify. Right. And, and I've had this discussion with church leaders as well. I've had stake presidents bishops, seminary teachers say, nobody in our ward. Um, right. I'm not aware of anyone in our stake who, who is old, like completely struggling. But then you say, well, statistically, if 10% or the new study that came out at BYU saying 13% or Gen Z's nearly 16% mm -hmm. identify somewhere along the spectrum, we're talking about 40 per, per ward. We could right. be talking about 200 per stake. Uh, we could, we're talking about five or six per family reunion. Mm -hmm. And when you start adding numbers up like that, you're, you're spot on. The reality is you do know someone who identifies along the spectrum. I want to shift the conversation um, just a little bit to you, Kara. You were raised in the same church as Tate. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you were straight. What was your perception of the LGBTQ community? What do you remember the church teaching regarding this topic? Um, I think being a girl had a little bit of difference. Like we were never really taught. I don't remember specifically, at least respecting, needing to learn how to respect men's bodies. It was more you need to dress modestly so that boys will respect you. Um, and I do remember things like how, um, the LGBTQ is attacking the family proclamation and this um, idea of the family is just so broken now because of this group of people. And I remember when I was an older young woman, probably 17 or 18, I started to kind of wake up out of just the following beliefs of either my parents or friends and just starting to question things like that doesn't match up with the love one another principle that we are trying, that we're teaching. You know, we're taught to love one another and taught to respect and always welcome and invite. But the way we talk about certain groups don't do any of those things. Um, so that was really difficult for me to accept that we teach it in some areas, but don't act on it in other areas. Um, and I had very, very close friends and even some family members that did openly identify as LGBTQ. And it's funny looking back now because 
it's like growing up, I had such a draw to them. They were just always so kind to me, even though they knew maybe my religion wasn't super welcoming of them. So I always respected that they were so open to hearing from me and accepting me. And so it drew me to them as well of the respect that they were giving, I wanted to give to them. And so it's just kind of neat to see like in hindsight, just I wonder if, if those relationships were made stronger for a reason, like to just understand it all the more and be more open to listening and welcoming others that are also in that community. Yeah, I think that's wonderful. It's almost as if you're saying they draw near me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. <laughs> <laughs> like the, the church knows that they can do better, but at some point, or because of stories like yours and many of them that are still yet to be told, the church is learning how to better love people. Yeah. Uh, uh, not just on paper, yeah. but in real life. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. The, um, some po- at some point, you two, prior to your mission, met <laughs> and started dating. How did that happen? <laughs> um, we had a mutual friend growing up in the stake, and so she, for some reason, was like, you guys should date <laughs> and set up a group hangout and bailed last minute. And we don't, <laughs> we don't know if that was on purpose or not, but we ended up hanging out and um, just really clicked. We were... I mean, we're still kind of giggly now, but just 16 year old giddy, nervous, giggly when we were younger. And so we connected really fast and just continued to hang out. And so then a few months later, probably it started turning more into like officially a relationship and not just flirting and unsure of what it was. Um, And so it's just sprouted from there just kind of started out as an accidental connection through a friend and um she thought we would get along really well and she was right so um yeah yeah it's funny because i remember so we were like i think barely 16 and there's this like idea of like don't like exclusively pair off right it's like just be groups and like flirt but don't get too attached to anyone um and i remember um so identify as queer and and i've been told you're bisexual you're pansexual you're all these things um i just identify as as queer because uh, i i view sexuality as a spectrum and and so it just allows me to i know i'm not straight and i'm somewhere else (laughs) and so um Growing up, I think I mentioned that I was I was trying to figure out how do I become straight, right? Straight is good, so how do I become that? And I figured I need to, like, figure out how to only like girls. That's, like, the first step. And so um, we, we met, and I was, uh, as she mentioned, <laughs> I, I was immediately attracted to her, to her smile, to her beauty, to her presence, and how she made me feel like that's the the big things that I remember and then I remember this like cultural guilt of like you need to not spend too much time with one girl and then this combating thing of like freak I'm trying not to like (laughs) like I'm trying to become straight here so like I think God understands you know like I just remember battling with this culture and this like these beliefs and just really just like poor Tate poor young Tate just like struggling with every little thing um and not just like living his life and trying to find joy um but yeah so I I remember that I remember clearly just this like um, this guilt from the, the LDS culture. Um, and then just being like, you know what, like I got bigger stuff going on. I like being around this girl and that's not very common for me. And so I'm just going to hold tight to her. And if people don't like that, they don't like that. But like, I enjoy being around her. And so, um, yeah, that, that's just something that I remember. And so as you, you, uh, dated into the point um, 
that you ended up serving a mission, um, still not, as you're saying, fixed or yeah. completely straight. What was mission life like? And then maybe both of you talk just a little bit about the state of your relationship as Tate went on to his mm -hmm. mission. Yeah, so so we, we broke up um, a little bit before my mission. It's funny looking back at my mindset at the time because I was very like, I need to keep all things good and repel all things bad. And so Kara was just not <laughs> going down the right path for me. And so, um, yeah, we, we decided to break up because we wanted different things out of life. And, and by we, I keep hearing like maybe Tate. It was... It was a little Honestly, bit of both. I was starting to just make some decisions that pulled me a little bit away from the church. And um, from my impression of Tate, it was like a very cookie cutter, strong LD, LDS boy. And so it was like, I'm not, we don't match up right now. And so. Um, yeah. And then from my perspective is like, I need to be this cookie cutter straight LDS boy. And so this isn't going to lead me down the right path. Um, and so it's, it's good that we are just friends Yeah, uh, because I, remember, I need to focus on my mission and I need to, you know, those type of things. Yeah. I remember it being like a bittersweet thing cause it felt like I was wanting to go another way, but I didn't want to let go of Tate in that relationship. So it was just kind of this difficult time. So that was probably like six months before you left. Yeah, at least. Um, and I don't think we talked much during that time. And then you left on your mission and we started casually writing letters and then it just kind of became more often. And then they'd go through phases of just catching up to flirty to we need to not flirt. I'm on a mission. <laughs> Elder <Amy. laughs> Then to um, I actually, while he was on his mission, started dating non-LDS boys which was really looked down upon, of course, and especially close family and friends. Um, but I think it was an experience I just really needed to learn because not, not anything that non-LDS people are not good people because they're, good people are everywhere in any religion, but specifically the ones I got involved in were not very healthy. Um, so I think... I just had a lot that I needed to learn from that. Um, and I ended up getting pregnant by one of my last relationships. And I was scared to death to tell Tate because he was on this mission. <laughs> he was, you know, this great LDS boy. And, you know, this is just going to crush everything. But how do I not tell him? And he comes home and I have a baby with me. So that was a really scary letter, probably few months before you came home or no probably about a year no. before I came you yeah came home, it was like it. a couple months in that you yeah came. and um he actually had responded really understanding and welcoming and loving and that just made a huge impression of like oh wow I thought this would be the end for sure um and so kind of after that we started to talk again like more like like, let's keep in touch, let's be talking, let's um, write a little bit more serious than just checking in, or we're not, we're not goofing off as much anymore of flirting and not flirting, and um, so I think at that point, it just kind of started to get a little bit more serious, like, are we going to make this into a relationship that'll last, or where is this going? I, I first, I think, on behalf of the audience, just want to acknowledge and and show appreciation for that type of candor because your experience Kara isn't something that is easy to discuss in terms of traditional Mormonism um, and and Tate yours as well it's almost at this point in the, in the interview you look at each of you and say with the Mormon goggles on you say oh well great both of them are damaged goods mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, here you are pregnant with a child out of wedlock here you are being ultra concert, ultra religious because you want to do everything right and times three or four in order to please God. So your same sex attraction, sexuality will change. And now by some miracle by God, you're 
both together, both chewed pieces of gum, Mormon words, <laughs> Mormon phrases that now have found each other. So did any of that in the back of your mind uh, resonate, become prevalent? Um, had you heard those descriptors before? Um, it's interesting because I like, y'all, trauma is real and like messages matter. Like deep to my core, I believed I was damaged goods, right? Like I was beyond lovable. Um, never did I think that about Kara. Like I remember her, her letter and different things and that was never my perspective of her being damaged goods or whatever. It was like, oh, now you have a baby. Cool. Like that will be different, but mm -hmm. let's see what happens. And, um, and it, I remember we've had several conversations about this, about how it's kind of been, been frustrating because, um, there were people who knew, knew about my sexuality and were like, oh my gosh, how perfect. Like she's been an outcast and you're an outcast and you can just love each other back to church. Um, and that hurt. Like it was an, it was annoying to constantly be, and just like constantly telling me of like how amazing that Kara, because of her, her experience, she can love you. Like it was, it was framed as in like, because she has experienced um, this pain, she's prepared to love you because no one could love you without pain. Like, um, if, that, if that makes any sense, it was just, you're a lot to handle, but she has some things to handle. And, and so you, you've been brought together and how amazing is that? And it was just, it was really painful to be like, okay, I guess I am not as lovable as you've told me I am. I, and I think it's exactly what you brought up in the beginning part of this podcast, how it was so easy for the church to say one thing, but so traditional that they do something different, as if they're saying your scarlet letter and your scarlet letter mm -hmm. belong in the same <laughs> alphabet, uh -huh. which is a different alphabet than us. But yeah. congratulations, yeah. the scarlets have met. <laughs> yeah. And that's difficult. Yeah. It just, it doesn't, it doesn't feel good. And she's talked about, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> from what I understand, kind of a similar. Yeah, similar, but a little bit different in the way that my family and people that were close to me didn't know about Tate's sexuality. So it was almost like, oh my gosh, we are so blessed that Tate wants to be <laughs> her dad and wants to marry you. Like, what a saving grace. And even though I was just as grateful and excited and happy that it was all working out, it kind of gave the message of like, this is our only hope. Like, whew, thank goodness this happened. This happened. Um, so yeah, it it does give off this hurtful vibe of like, I'm not good enough. But thank goodness someone found to, found you and loves you, because yeah. that that couldn't happen if Tate wasn't there. You know. Um, yeah, I love you, but I didn't think anyone else could love you. So thank goodness we found this person that yeah. understands and is willing to look past your baggage. That concept is so mind boggling, mind blowing, but familiar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's gotta change. That's yeah. just amazing. I think one point that we should have brought up, so we'll reverse just yeah. a second and then go forward, <laughs> was that, uh, Kara, you did know that Tate identified uh, as queer prior to um, you guys entering into a, a relationship. So. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that experience, how, how Tate came out and, and what your initial gut reaction was. Um, so I didn't know all the way up until his mission. He had told me after he had come home. So at this point, we were pretty seriously talk, talking. We had a little girl involved now, my daughter. Um, so our relationship was getting pretty serious. Um, so I remember maybe a month after he went on his mission, he was 
getting ready to go up to school in another state. So um, it was a lot of decisions. And so I remember him talking to me at a park one night and he just, I don't remember words. I remember it kind of (laughs) um, overwhelming. And I think deep down I knew what he was about to say. And I have (laughs) memories of telling some of my cousins that I trusted that I had suspected this of Tate, that, that he might be gay or, um, but all my reasons were just the very stereotypical, well, he's in choir and he has a lot of friends that are girls, like things like that. So I didn't have, you know, I don't know, just, I had just had a lot of judgment with it, but I was still really attracted to him, his looks and personality. So it didn't bother me, but I remember bringing it up. So I think I had noon known all along and so when he sat me down to talk to me I remember my response was just kind of like yeah (laughs) I know and you know initially it was just very like yeah I know and but then I remember the next couple days it was kind of like well what does this really mean and how you know it hit a lot harder as the days went on and just that this takes a lot more thought than just okay, you know, and let's move on. Um, I wanted to make sure I wasn't being naive about it and that I wasn't bringing my daughter into something that could end up being toxic for her if our relationship didn't work out or um, just lots of things like that. And so I remember praying about it and just thinking about it a lot, um, feeling still kind of like shocked that, that what I had always wondered was actually true and like what would this mean for my relationship and my marriage Um, but ultimately I remember feeling like this is still right and good to go forward with Um, I never got the feeling of like this is gonna make it go away this is going to be a breeze it's all fixed because now he told me and we're gonna get married Um, but I do remember feeling like this is okay this is something that you can work on together or be together with. Um, so that was really encouraging. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember getting a vibe of like absolute relief because I literally thought she was going to run away. Like as soon as I said those words, um, and like never talk to me again. Um, but So I remember relief, and then I remember kind of being concerned, like, she heard me, right? Like, she understands (laughs) what this means, and kind of over a long time, just, like, continuously being, like, now remember, like, this is is where I'm coming from. Like, this is my experience, and you're not making sure that she couldn't um, not understand. (laughs) what what that meant now on your mission uh, we talked about being ultra religious and and working your very hardest to have all this taken away Mm -hmm. uh, in the initial part of the podcast and as you stepped off the airplane prior to this discussion Mm -hmm. um, that hadn't gone away Mm -hmm. how did that play a factor into this I'm still damaged I still feel broken now Kara's saying, I guess we could move forward. I mean, not even an I guess. Yeah. The door is open. Like, let's, mm-hmm. I'm okay with this. Was that healing? In, was there a healing factor in, in that message from Kara that you didn't get from the universe, from religion, from God, that you had worked so hard to try to obtain? That you weren't as broken as you thought you were? That you were now accepted for who and what you were? I think that that healing has taken a long time. Um, I think that was the message she tried to portray of like, you're not damaged goods, I still love you. But the message had gone way deep to my core that it was instead of accepting that of, oh, you still love me? It was like, okay, no, you must not understand what I'm saying you must not grasp how unlovable I am um, because you're still here. And so um, 
I just remember really for almost all of my relationships, this constant fear of if you really knew me and really understood me, you would no longer love me. Um, and so whenever I did hear compliments of, of my good traits or compliments of I love you, immediately in my mind it was, but you don't really know me. You wouldn't say those things if you knew me. And um, so just not never accepting, really accepting a compliment or accepting that there was any good thing about me um, because it was always followed with, you actually don't know what you're saying. Um, and so that healing absolutely has come, but it's taken so much work and therapy and and trusting her that and, and opening up and, and her continuously showing up and saying, no, I still love you. Um, so absolutely that healing has come and that message has come um, from her acceptance and listening and and continuing to love me. But it wasn't immediate um, because I didn't believe it. Um, and so over time, that healing has come as she continuously has shown up and continuously been unconditional about her loving. No matter what I was doing, she still loved me. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being honest and, and candid about that experience. I think it's this part of the, the interview and sharing your story that we get into the actual marriage, the mixed orientation marriage part of your story. And with that comes probably a few caveats. Like, um, and I, I think in the interest of being completely candid and, and transparent in this topic, mixed orientation marriages are tough. Yeah. Statistically, they fail when the non-straight spouse primarily identifies as homosexual or on a Kinsey scale, mm -hmm. if those who are familiar with the Kinsey scale, a Kinsey scale of four or higher, um, men, Primarily, the, the non-straight spouse who enter into relationships um, with women in, in mixed orientation marriages um, end those relationships early. Uh, the satisfaction rates are very low. Uh, some studies have said the satisfaction rate between both straight and non-straight spouse in mixed orientation marriages um, are equivalent to those who suffer with lupus. Wow. Um, so. A lot, of, a lot of research out there that um, is really quick and easy to say, oh, they'll never work. There's no happiness in mixed orientation relationships. The reverse side of that is I do know mixed orientation relationships that have worked. Um, the other part of that is that often um, marriages or re relationships in religious lenses are used as weapons. Uh, the stories of those who are navigating the journey um, with an Instagram glow, um, the soft focus social media spin uh, is often used by well-intentioned grandmothers and mothers <laughs> who say, see, they can make it work. Why don't you just go marry a woman right. because uh, so-and-so are making it work. And I don't think that's the purpose of you sitting down in this interview today or me promoting a mixed orientation marriage episode on this podcast is to say, Hey mom, look, here's another couple that's making it work. Right. Um, in your, in your situation, um, there are a few things that alter those results. And the first was, was disclosure. Carrie, you knew about Tate's sexuality prior to you making that commitment. That's, that's a hurdle, um, yeah. that you jumped early on in that mission, in that, um, process. Uh, Tate, similar, similarly in your situation, um, you were, you were open about your, your experience. However, um, you were still very much attached to the Mormon message that mission, marriage, children makes mm -hmm. this all go away mm -hmm. and that I'm damaged until it, it evacuates. And as you walked off that airplane coming home from your mission, you were still there in, on that spectrum. And, right. and that's oft, often feeling that gives you a, a feeling of defeat that I didn't do something good enough and, mm -hmm. and, and I know how that works. So let's discuss a little, a little bit about your marriage. What is working? Like what, what have you found um, as tools to help you make this marriage work? And maybe your advice to other couples who are in this situation. Yeah. Um, I mean, first I just want to echo what you said. Um, absolutely. That's not 
my intention. And, and I would say for those who are straight and have, um, have people that they care about, um, please don't use our story to try to convince them to live differently because that's not how agency works. That's not how God's plan works. Um, and, and also let people live their lives and let them be on their own path. I, I've told my family and, and people that I care about, like I needed to step away from the church. I needed to experience the quote gay lifestyle. That's what I needed because if I had just stepped off the airplane and into marriage and into the temple, I would constantly have this doubt of what is, what is it that I'm missing? What is, what is, you know, I remember before when I was white knuckling it and trying to, to convince myself I was straight and trying to be righteous enough. It was constantly, whenever any upset happened, it was like, oh, well, like maybe this would be different if I was authentic. So what happened was once I let go of trying to do what everyone else wanted me to do and just lived my life, I realized I was still a good person. Like I still had the love of Christ in my life. I still served. I still did volunteer work. Like I was a good person. And that contradicted the narrative that if you are not on this straight path and always doing a hundred percent everything right you're going to be miserable um and i wasn't there was there was joy in my life um even when i wasn't living the gospel and so that that caused me to kind of ponder of like okay so something's not matching up and and for me i have my own ideology but everyone just needs to to have the freedom to, to figure it out on, on their own. And I, I believe that God trusts us to, to, um, to find our own way and, and that he wants us to choose him, whatever that looks like, um, for us. And so anyways, I just wanted to make sure that people are, people know that I am not proclaiming this is the one way that you can be good in God's eyes and you need to live like me. Um, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard to um, to challenge norms, right? Like on both sides, I have I have people from the LGBTQ community constantly doubting my marriage and saying you're not really happy, and then I have people in the LDS community who are saying, "Ooh, you're not fitting the norm." And what what does that mean about you? And, and where are you going in life? Um, so I would say that for us, like you said, disclosure and just absolute honesty all of the time has what has made the relationship work, at least for me, because my whole life growing up was so such a facade, um, and the anxiety and self-hate that came from that was really strong, um, leading to suicidal ideation the majority of the time. Um, I don't want suicidal ideation in, in my marriage and in my life. And uh, I, found, I find that it's strongest for me when I feel um, like, I'm being, like I'm being inauthentic and, and trying to live for someone else. And so we've had really um, honest and hard discussions. And I remember, so... Um, I remember not thinking that it was going to be perfect, but before my marriage, just thinking like, have faith and, and it will all be all right. It might be hard, but it will all be all right. Um, and then we got married and um, there was a lot of really beautiful, amazing things. And there was a lot of really hard things, um, both for Kara and for me. And so I, I had to take a really in-depth, honest look into myself and what I wanted. And ultimately what I've come up with is I just want to live authentically and I want to, to the things that bring me joy, I want to keep those close. And the things that bring me shame, I don't need those in my life anymore. 
Um, and so I find the love of God that brings me joy. The love of my spouse that brings me joy. The love of my children that brings me joy. Um, there's other parts of, of the culture that don't bring me joy and that bring me shame. And so I try to find a way of how can I have the best of both worlds. Um, so the biggest thing is talking to Karen and, and letting her into my perspective of I love you and I love all of you. And sometimes that love looks different, right? It's not always this like Hallmark or Hollywood version of like, I just want to have sex with you all day, every day. And like, just romance all the time. Flowers and sunshines. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, you're my best friend and I want to be with you forever. And so I just, I, I, it was really scary, but I had to open up and I was like, Hey, my sexuality like ebbs and flows. And so there's some times where, yeah, I want to like have that loving romantic, um, aspect. And there's sometimes that it's not quite there for me, but that doesn't mean that I don't want to be with you. And so sometimes like I love you like a best friend and sometimes I love you like a lover. And is it okay? Are you okay with being in a, in a marriage where I'm not a hundred percent on all the time, if that makes any sense. I think it makes perfect sense. And it's, it's exactly why it's really difficult to navigate mixed orientation marriages mm -hmm. because often in that marriage, um, we strive for as close to a hundred percent and fairly, I don't know many relationships that are able to give a hundred percent. So I, I think that aspect of it has to be acknowledged. Carrie, in your situation, what is, what are the hard parts? We rarely are able to hear the, the straight spouse side <laughs> of this topic. What are the hard parts? And, and listening to Tate explain what it's like to um, experience um, the marriage from his perspective. Um, and I will give you a chance to talk about the great parts too, but I, I really <laughs> do want to just jump into uh, just the candid, honest, um, yeah, thanks Tate, but like here's, <laughs> here's the reality of my situation. Um, let's see. I think, I think it's been really good to find open communication. And as that's been a spectrum and a path that we're not have, we don't have all figured out, um, along with that has come, like, you need to be open to knowing that something might be said that's not totally comfortable or not feel that great. Um, so just kind of like throughout our marriage, I remember just, I don't know, specific things that had happened, but times where it was like, it would just hit like, oh yeah, this definitely is a part of our marriage. Like it's not just something super lighthearted and, and that you can just brush off. Like his same sex attraction definitely has an effect. And I remember getting down on myself a lot for, um, realizing like I could never be a man. I could never do or be what, whatever he's attracted to in men. And so that was discouraging at certain times of like, I can only be part of what you want. That's how it felt. Um, and so it, it almost felt like I always needed to be the best wife and woman I could be in order to keep him with me instead of wanting to go to a man because I could never achieve that. Um, so as like we've had discussions and things like that, I've, that thought has come less and less to my mind, but that was definitely a hard thing to accept and understand and really just talk to him about it of, are you sure this is right for you? You know, that this is really what you want. You don't feel like you're holding back by being married to me or that you're not doing it to prove it to anyone else. Um, and I remember those questions were scary because of course I want him to say like, no, this is everything. <laughs> and this is, you know, I did this all for myself, but there's always a possibility too of 
getting a real honest answer of like what he said, like it ebbs and flows. And sometimes it's like really great. And sometimes I'm like missing the things that we don't have in our relationship. And so, um, I think, I think it's a, been a hard battle of wanting open communication and wanting honesty, but almost like not wanting certain answers, <laughs> um, or not wanting certain things to happen in life, even the little things like, so I think that's the hardest battle I deal with, with is wanting to be open and honest, but also wanting to guard myself from anything that might hurt me or might not be the answer I'm expecting. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting. Um, <laughs> when I talk to my therapist, she's like, um, <laughs> just because our, our traumas that we've endured in our lives um, are very like our triggers are almost the opposite. So, so, um, when Kara feels like a sense of this isn't a hundred percent connected, oh my gosh, is he going to leave me? Right. Like, like Charlotte's dad, just, you know, that whole situation, like there's several things in her life where people have just left. Um, and there's been situations in my life where, um, people have, have, um, either directly or indirectly told me you need to not be you, um, in order for me to love you. And, um, or I can't be with you. I can't love you because of who you are. Uh, so, so that's hard because I'm, I'm constantly trying to figure out and, and trying to, trying to heal from that and, and live authentically and trying to, to find myself and make sure that I'm living true to myself and finding joy in my life. And also for Kara, that's hard because there's no script for this, right? We don't talk about this at church. We don't talk about this is how you have a mixed orientation marriage and what it looks like. And so that kind of pricks at the, the trauma of, this isn't a hundred percent perfect. So does that mean he's, he's leaving? Right. I don't know if that, that makes sense, but, um, but it's interesting how both of our, our traumas, um, impact us differently and how we have to be really clear with our messaging of this is what I'm saying. And yeah. this is what that means. Um, it's taken a lot of learning cause we've done a lot of things that has ended up triggering the other person, really bad and our intention is different and so it's just taken a lot of trial and error Mm -hmm. (laughs) and advice from other mixer orientation marriages but also it's never just exactly what their advice is it's their advice with maybe our our personal little twist because it's what works for us and so it's just been a lot of like walking blindly and trying (laughs) to figure out what we're doing and how to how to do this healthily and safely and all of those things so we can both be happy and be and feel safe and feel accepted in this mixed orientation marriage i I think that uh, i think that resonates well with the audience kind of as we wrap up the podcast um two questions one is a very blunt and a blunt question um but then i'll follow up with uh just kind of a follow just a wrap up but um your two daughters and son Mm -hmm eventually grow up and one of them identifies on the spectrum would you encourage a mixed orientation marriage or encourage one of your children to get into a mixed orientation marriage hmm. that's a really good question yeah. um i would say neither because my children are not me it, um i i really struggle with with parents in the church who are who um, are so unsettled by their children's choices to not live in the church because of what it means about them. And it's like, let them live their lives. Let them be themselves. Um, so I would say I, what we strive for is complete honesty and um, with our children and letting our children know no matter what you choose, we will love you. And so 
trying to model for them and help them see um, what feels true for them, if, if that makes sense. So if what brings my daughter the most happiness is um, being with another woman, then I will support her in that. If it's being in the church and being with a man, then I'll support her with that. If it's she realizes she doesn't identify as female um, and, and feels more comfortable in her own skin identifying as male, then I'll support that. I want her to know that she is one of the most important things in my life, no matter what actions she's doing. And I will always love her and, and God will always love her no matter what. And nothing she can do will lose that from me. Yeah, I think, I think the same that the support would come from whatever relationship they chose. Um, but say that they lived with same-sex attraction and were in a relationship with the opposite sex and they were considering marriage. Um, I, wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't discourage it. Um, it's not like a breeze and easy, but is any marriage really like, I don't know. I've never been in a different marriage, but from what I know is every marriage has baggage and issues and things like that. And so just to make sure that that's the right fit for you and, you know, talk about the complications, but also talk about the great things that come of it and have them make the decision. Is that something that is, is there more pros than cons to you? Um, for me, there was more pros in being in this relationship than not. So, but I know many people that have no interest or have tried it and it didn't end up working out. And that's totally fine. It's like Tate was saying, like our purpose of coming here is not to convince anyone that this is the way to do it. Um, I've, I've seen a lot of people be happier in different relationships because it was their choice. Um, so I think that's ultimately the goal of finding your safety and your happiness. And, um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, it does. And, <laughs> and, uh, and I think that maybe the follow up, which could be a completely different podcast episode would be that, um, when we get into relationships and realize that they're not working, that it's okay to yeah. separate yeah. that relationship. Yes. And often when we talk about relationships specific to Mormonism, mm -hmm. um, this topic comes up long after the um, altar at the temple. Right. Which um, not only is marriage for time, but also mm -hmm. eternity right. in Mormon vernacular. So it becomes so much more concrete and more difficult for someone to exit a relationship because they feel like they're too indebted at that mm -hmm. point. Yeah. And so it, I think what you're talking about, Kara, is really important. And you also, Tate, that we, you have to go into a relationship in full disclosure, but also know that if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Yeah. And that um, as well intentioned as we are when it comes to marriage, sometimes it just doesn't work. Yeah. Right. And we have to be okay with, with making that separation as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and clearly, after plenty of discussion. <laughs> Anything we haven't uh, talked about that you want to bring up that we haven't discussed? Some final points as we round the corner? I don't think so. I think our main thing was just to make sure that we were just sharing our story, but not in a way to convince anybody that this is what they should do. But just anyone who may be in a relationship like ours can use this interview to veer themselves in a decision one way or the other. They can hear what we have to say and want to try it out themselves in a mixed orientation marriage or that's just not for them. And so that's my main hope of it is just maybe that there's somebody listening because they need an answer, they need help in a decision and what we have to say can help them make that decision, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, I think yeah. informed decisions yeah. is so important. Whether, you know, there's going to be people who find out about their partner's sexual orientation after they're married. Um, that's still better than living a lie, right? And, and then again, it's, okay, more information and what does that mean for a relationship and, and where am I going to find happiness? So I think 
information is always good. It's not always comfortable, but it's always good and, and informs. It's better to inform people so that they can honestly make the decision. And it feels so amazing. Like her knowing that she's choosing me completely, knowing everything about me, like that's real love and, that I didn't experience before I came out to people because there was always that seed of doubt of, but you don't, you think you love me, but you don't really know me. Um, so it, it always feels better, even even if it's uncomfortable in the process or hurtful in the process. Once everything settles, it always feels better. And, and I think I just want people to know, like, there's always hope. There's always love out there for you. No one is too broken or too damaged. Whatever it is that you feel like is is um, too much about you or too different about you, it's not. God loves you, and there's someone out there who loves you for you, and that feels beautiful. Um, and and for for members of the LDS community, um, please remember we're still there. Like, we're sitting next to you in the pews. We're listening to your testimonies. Um, we're listening to conversations in the hallway. Um, people make assumptions that because I'm married to a woman, I will have similar um, views as them and similar political opinions or um, assumptions of how I live life that I, people make assumptions that I think gay people are disgusting and make jokes to me. And it's like, I have to inform them after that of, oh, actually, I'm one of those people that you're making fun of. Um, so just be kind and, and realize that you know someone, maybe they don't feel safe enough to open up to you, but you know someone that identifies, uh, many people that identify as LGBTQ. Um, and, and to take a reflection of how can you live in a way that makes those people feel more safe around you. Be ye the safe space. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a great message. It's a great place to end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving us a few minutes of your time to share your story, which I do believe it will have um, the ability to resonate with many who listen and hopefully see this um, topic in a slightly different light. Um, something a little more kind and something with a little bit more favor. Again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Latter Gay Stories podcast, your opportunity to better understand this intersection. We appreciate Kara and Tate for sharing their story. If you have a question uh, for this couple and you are watching on our video version, particularly here on Facebook, we invite you to share your comment or question below and we'll see if we can open up a little bit of a dialogue. Uh, regarding their situation. If you are uh, watching on our YouTube channel, we invite you to subscribe to the channel to catch not only this episode, but many others um, on various topics surrounding the LGBTQ community. If you are listening on our audio versions through Stitcher, iTunes, Google, or one of the, one of the many other uh, podcast players, we invite you to subscribe to this channel and share it as well with those who may have interest in it. The Latter Gay Stories podcast, a deep dive into the intersection of LD, LDS Street and LGBTQ Avenue. But most importantly, it's podcast episodes just like this that help you to continue writing your Latter Gay story.